Hello and welcome to Mad About Gardening. It's June and we've got a bumper programme for you coming up. We certainly have. Now today I'm going to be planting a very, very special rose in a really beautiful container. I'm going to be taking a look at the potatoes that I planted last month and showing you the progress there. We'll also be taking a look at the gladioli that I planted and I'm going to be giving you a nice, lovely tour of the borders. I'm also going to be planting out our dahlia as well. So I'm going to be looking at the progress of our vegetables and I'll be planting out our dwarf French beans and our tomatoes now that risk of frost has now finally passed. Thank goodness. And I'll also be showing you how we can grow a cucumber in a container. So there's lots and lots coming up. Some very exciting things happen happening on today's programme. First of all, I'm going to take you back now to a very special date in May where I planted a very special rose for quite a special anniversary. The end of May is always a very poignant time for me because seven years on the 25th of May 2016 was when I had my Whipple procedure for tumours of the pancreas. Now Whipple procedure is major abdominal surgery because I had three tumours in the head of my pancreas. So it's a huge big thing to go through and to be, to be still here all this time on is such an honour and a privilege and so Paul thought it a really good idea if he bought a special rose for me to commemorate this special anniversary because seven years is absolutely wonderful and so he bought this one and this is nostalgia now he let me choose it but it's a really nice rose it's a lovely creamy white center with red around the edges of the petal and around this the plan is to use this great pot because this terracotta pot was something that we had at the front door now as you will remember it was beautiful it was filled with all these gorgeous lemon colored pansies and it was so nice this is incidentally going to go back at the front door so it's quite a welcome whenever i come into the house it's going to be really lovely with these beautiful blooms now nostalgia before i go on to these nostalgia as a rose because i'm a big great rose lover always have been um, is quite a fragrant rose it's not the most scented but it is it does have quite a nice scent and i do recommend it i know my uh, my auntie had this in her garden and she really really enjoyed it um a few years ago uh, she's no longer with us but she, she really did like this one and it, it's just perfect because you know nostalgia i know it wasn't a very happy time for me um seven years ago coming up but it is in a way that it makes you reflect on life and makes you realize what life is all about and it's about family it's about love and it's not about the other things that we, we sometimes get wrapped up with but anyway back to gardening we're going to plant this rose i'm going to get that in the pot and the idea is to get it nearer to the back because i want to plant these gorgeous osteospermums okay and we've got two red and then a beautiful purpley color and i think together and if you look at that already i just think they make a stunning combination they're going to be great with this rose so you imagine that there's going to be you know something like that it's not going to be the same but something like that they're going to be amazing so i've already filled with lots of wonderful nutritious compost this pot so it's filled to about here which gives me space to plant the rose it's also got farmyard manure in so we've got lots of lovely compost but there is farm farmyard manure in there as well so it's a really good mix and it's going to be fantastic for this rose because roses need a lot of feeding they're not a plant that you could put into a, a pot like this or any kind of container and just leave if you do 
they're not going to thrive. They're going to die off eventually. They need to be. I mean, even in the garden, if you're growing roses in the garden, you need to feed them. You need to look after them. They thank you for it by rewarding you with the most beautiful blooms. Whereas if you just stick, you know, this rose in a pot and think, oh, how wonderful, it looks lovely. Blah, 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 oh, all done. Leave it sooner or later you're going to come unstuck because it really does like the nutrients. It's a thirsty plant for nutrients. It loves it. It needs it to survive. So I'm going to pop that there for a second. So I'm really happy with these that we managed to get um, this morning, actually. We managed to buy these this morning. The rose has been in this container and we've had it obviously from when we bought and we bought that um, in the last few weeks. But it's more than ready to go in now. So the idea is I'm gonna plant this. So come on, let's get planting. So this is the really exciting bit, getting the plant actually into the pot. So I'm gonna keep that little label. I always like to keep labels. So probably end up putting a drawer somewhere, but I always do like to keep the labels um, of roses, not of anything else, but of roses. So, I'm going to tease this out of its pot. Let's give the pot a good squeeze first of all. And I've already given it a little water before it goes in as well because it will thank us for that. And look at that. Some really, really good roots going on there. That's fantastic. It's not um, pot bound as such or anything. So it's, it's just happy to now be going into its new home. Now there's a reason why I'm going to place the rose towards the back of the container, not in the center, and put the plants, the osteosperms, sperm, spermums, around it. There's a reason for this. Now, that is because it's going at the front door. There'll be a wall behind. So about where you are now, to where you're facing, there will be a wall here so we need the front part of the pot for the additional planting. So that's really, really important. So to help you to understand why I'm putting the rose at the back and not in the center of the pot. So this is perfect. It's in the perfect position. I've got the crown there, I've just got hold of it. And it's gonna allow, that will be above the soil. And obviously it will allow for rain water to not the last thing you want when you're doing pots and, and you know containers and things is to fill the soil right up to the top of the container it rains the rain wash all your water your plants and it just washes all over the side that's not a good thing you need to allow the water to filter through the pot and that means planting way below this level here so what i'm going to do is put some compost around back of it. So I'll start filling in behind the rose first of all. Now I was very lucky when I had my operation because the Whipple procedure is a major, major surgery. It's one of the biggest surgeries you can have done. And I was very poorly for a long time after it, but it was well worth it because I found out that my tumours were caught in time. So if they had not been, then I wouldn't be here now to, to tell the tale. So. It's a very special time and I'm always very grateful this time of year, every year, but seven years you start thinking about, you know, a lot of things and certainly about people that are not, are not able to, to be in that position and it's a, it's a privilege. So I'm very, very grateful. But this rose is going to love it here and, you know, ideally, you'd pop a rose into the ground, into a, into a good space, but you can, if you feed them, you can have roses in containers like this, but you do need to feed, you do need to look after them. Um, they're not gonna thank you if you just, as I've said, just put them in and, and leave them. So, let's have a look. So our crown's above the, the, the compost level there. So we're doing well. I firmed him in. Does need more soil, they're more compost, but I'm going to start to plant these beauties now. So these are so beautiful. They love the sun 
and I just know that they're going to be perfect in this container. I really do. So I'm going to place those on top of the soil and then pop the compost in around them. Just untangle the roots a little bit. I always like to do that. In fact, I'll put some more compost in because they do look like they need, um, they can handle a lot more in there. So what I'm gonna do is sort of, not like that, place them in so that they are, you know, we've got the two colors are really complementing each other there. Now there is room for the last one as well. It's going to go more in front of the rows there. And again, I'm going to have to squeeze all this compost in. I'll make sure that it's all pressed down a little later. But first of all, the most important thing is that we make sure that all this pot has been filled correctly. So yeah, that's looking good. That's fantastic. I'm so pleased with this. It's going to be lovely. It's going to be a pleasure to, to see it as a welcome every time we're coming through that door. So that's better. So I'm firming in the root ball as well of the rose because that is really, really important. We don't want to leave any gaps around there. Now, we are super super posh here today because we have this lovely wheelie thing and this allows us to move it has little brakes on on each of the four wheels and it allows us to move the pot from the front to the back of the house now the reason why we got this is because last time paul tried to move this pot he nearly hurt his back quite seriously so this is a worthwhile investment. So if you've not got one of these little wheeler things for your pots, you need to get one really because it saves on the old back. It really does. And if you're someone that's used to, you know, being in a lot of pain like I am, it does make life a lot easier. In addition to the plants we already have inside the pot, I'm going to add a few French marigolds in strategic places, so I'm going to use four in this container. And the reason for this is I think they'll look lovely. And French marigolds, so marigolds themselves, will repel aphids. So it's sort of like a, the, the, there's method in it as well as the beauty. There's, there's a reason for using them as well. Because every little helps, doesn't it? And it's best to try and do what we can. And the reason why they repel aphids is because of the aromatic foliage. It's the foliage that does it. They do not like the smell. So they don't want to be near it. So if we pack these in, well, I'm only gonna use four, but if we put these in around the rows, it's, it's gonna save um, a lot on the old uh, aphid steaks. There's, there's gonna be less of them. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be wonderful. It's all little things that we can do as gardeners just to, to make that bit of difference. And I really do like French marigolds as well. Because I remember when I was little, my mum used to put these in the garden at the back. And so these were something, I mean, when I was a toddler, I was only very little, but I do remember it well. I like the vibrant orange as well as the, uh, the yellows as well. I really do like that. And then I put the other one, put this one on the other side there. As I say, a bit more compost in there. Now, I think I can safely say 
that that pot is completed. It looks stunning. I am so, so happy with this. And I can't wait to come home to the beautiful scent of the roses and just see these gorgeous flowers because it makes life such a pleasure. And that was the reason, you know, Paul suggested that I do this special pot because that's what life's about, especially for us gardeners. It's about treasuring every second in the garden. And I'm very grateful for every second that I do get to spend in the garden. Now, let me just give a little bit of advice. If you're gonna plant a rose in a pot, make sure the pot is a substantial size. You do not want to be buying a nice rose like the one that's planted here from the garden center or, or nursery, um, ordering it online, however you choose to do it, and then coming back with a little pot like so and placing the rose in so that all the roots basically fill the pot. It's got nowhere to go. It's not able to live. It's not going to thank you for it. It's not going to flourish. And to be perfectly honest, it's, it's going to eventually die. It's, it's, it's just not going to be happy. It's going to be very, uh, what should we say, sickly. Um, so the bigger the pot, the better. Now we can manage this because it is a big pot. It's not huge, but it's big enough and we can look after this rose and give it all the nourishment it needs by, you know, every so often, I mean, I don't mean every week or a few months, but certainly every year it'll get a fresh compost in there. It will be fed constantly as well. We will be feeding um, the plants, but obviously the rose as well. So it will be a constant feeding process to give him the nourishment that he needs to grow, to flourish, because we want those flowers. Um, so yeah, but I just love this exciting array. It makes you feel like you're somewhere nice and warm and sunny and, and it's cheery as well. It's vibrant. It's just what's needed, literally, it really is. And such, certainly at the front door as well, I always think that's a very, very special place because it's the entrance to your home. It's the first thing that people see. You know, they pull up the driveway or they park on, on the front or near to your house, depending on what kind of house you are, or apartment or, you know, you know, wherever. If you've got a balcony, you could put one of these on a balcony as well. But when you have a front garden, the door is the first place that people come to. And you really, it really is nice to have something like this to welcome you in and to welcome your guests in as well. It's not just about your guests, it's about you as well but it's nice to have that special bit of interest. And also you get people walking past as well saying, oh, look at that pot, isn't it amazing? And there's, there's nothing better than that feeling. Um, you know, seeing people walk past and enjoying the, the, the planting and, and commenting on it. And it gives other people ideas as well, because some people wouldn't think of growing a rose in a pot or putting this kind of combination together, or it could be anything that you do. And, you know, it gets people interested and that's what gardening is as well. It's about sharing ideas and sometimes pinching ideas from other people as well, because you see what other people have done sometimes and, and you might like to try that. And that's wonderful. And that's the best thing about gardening. So I'm really happy with this. Now, this is going to be wheeled around the front um, later on, but so it's be placed back at the front door, but it's going to have a really, really good water while it's here, around the back, and it's just going to have a good water because remember, all that compost we've put in, it might be nutritious, but let me tell you, you know, after an hour on the front, this compost is going to be bone dry. The plants need water and they need settling in. I know I said we'd done the rose earlier, yes, but it needs doing again. It all needs a really good drink to settle it all in. And so that's what we're going to do. Now, after all that planting, we're going to now join Paul as he takes a look at his vegetables. Thank you, Andrew. That rose is going to be a beautiful position there. We're going to be able to get all that fragrance as we come through the front door. Now, we come back to this small vegetable bed. And as you can see, it has transformed from when you last saw it last month. We've managed to buy some hooped netting and this has been perfect. The size of this has just fit this plot perfectly. I couldn't have asked for better. So this is helping to keep all the squirrels, the cats, and also the pigeons away 
specifically from the cabbage. So this netting was put on a few weeks back and it was very easy to do. It was just a case of getting it out of the packet, unraveling it and placing it in. And the good thing is these hoops themselves, these metal parts are quite pliable. So you are able to fit it into the space that you want it to be. So that's been really useful because this bed is quite a, a narrow bed. As you can also see, I've got a couple of rungs of twine against the fence and that is to hold the peas and very soon the dwarf French beans as well. So we have had a little bit of an issue with, the, with some of the things in here. The beetroot and the carrots got nobbled by the slugs. So I've had to re-sow some beetroot in a container. So I'm doing that in plugs and then when they're large enough, I'll then fill them into the gaps. And the carrots, I've re-sown some actually direct into the bed and I've also put some again into trays as well. So hopefully, I mean the carrots now are germinating nicely so hopefully they'll be okay now. I'm hoping this netting because it is enclosed will keep the slugs out as well so fingers crossed. With regards to the cabbage, the cabbage was as you remember that I sewn it direct quite clustered together and that wasn't giving it enough room to grow in this space. The space is very small so I've had to thin it out so I've got two rows and I've got two rows of, of three whereas before I had maybe seven eight nine plus plants so I've taken them out, I've actually put some of those into containers and I also, we also ate some of those as microgreens. So none of, them got, none of them went to waste. So the netting itself, specifically for the cabbages, is going to help with the cabbage white butterfly because that can come onto the cabbages and wreak devastation. So we're keeping that away with the, with the help of this netting. Spring onions are doing really good. They're growing strongly. The Swiss chard is now ready for picking and also what I'm really pleased about is the radish. So it's been now probably about maybe between six and seven weeks since it was sown and it's probably now ready to be harvested. I can just see the little radishes poking out through the top of the soil. So it's going to be time to be taking some of them up. So I'm going to do that in a moment. And further at the very end, I've got the perpetual spinach and that again is doing really, really well. So what we're going to do first is I've got these dwarf French beans. So if you remember back, I sown the seeds into these pots. I have two pots and they've grown brilliantly. Now that risk of frost has passed, we can now get those into the ground. So I've got how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, I think. So obviously it's a lot to put into this small bed. So I'm just going to be quite frugal and I'm probably going to put just maybe four of these plants in there. So I'm just going to move this netting just slightly inwards. As you can see, it's very pliable. So it's very easy to move and maneuver. I'm just wanting to get some space just behind so that I can put these dwarf French beans in. So I'm just going to take these plants out of the pot to begin with. So I'm just going to dig a hole at the very back of this bed. It's going to be quite deep and I'm just going to pop one of my little plants down the very back of that hole. And just firm it around. And then probably get another one there. of a tight squeeze they'll be fine that one there so 
I'm just going to end up with three because there's the concrete of that post there too close to there so three is going to be plenty in that little space and then regards to the hoops I'm just going to put them back to where they originally were so I'm enclosing all the crops in the front but I'm going to leave those green beans free to climb up So I'll give them a water in a little while. So I'm now going to do a little bit of harvesting. So this is quite an exciting moment. So what I'm going to be doing is seeing if I can just get some of this beautiful radish up. Got pigeons trying to attack us at all, all angles. So this netting does also slide. So you can slide it like that if you want to get into it without disturbing any of the metal poles and if you just look at that that is beautiful you can just see those lovely red tops and they're seeing that they are perfect now for picking so I'm gonna go in and just harvest a few Wow that's a baby one that can go back in. Look at that. That is amazing. So I can pop that into my little trug. And I'll just take a few more out. The good thing about these is they're so quick to actually mature. So probably don't even need that. I'm just going to pull just a few up. I'll just thin these out. Wow, perfect. Absolutely perfect. So that's probably enough for lunch. And I'm just gonna pop that little one that I pulled out back in there, because that can grow on. And then I'm also going to pick some of this chard, because I'm gonna add this to a salad with the radish so I'm just going to pick some of the leaves now that it's getting nice and mature and if you just keep picking chard like this it's pretty much a cut and come again type of crop so you can take as much as you need and leave the rest to grow wow just look at those lovely colours that lovely yellow centre and those lovely yellow sticks. Fantastic. I'm just going to take a bit of that and a bit more. And I've also sown some more Swiss chard because you can never have enough of it. This row has done really well. Now the second row only has four plants in there. So I'll probably stick a few of those back in there once they get a bit bigger from the containers. That's perfect. So I'm just going to close that back down. And I've just got some small little pebbles just to put along the edges to make sure that this is completely closed off. And then lastly, on the very end, I'm just going to go and get some of this spinach as well. So this is perpetual spinach and again you can chop it as and when you need it or let it grow and mature into a vegetable that you can then go ahead and steam. But all these tender beautiful leaves are just so appealing that I'm going to take a few up now because we're going to enjoy a really good salad 
for lunch. And this is so satisfying, knowing that all these have grown from seed, no chemicals, no travelling, no mileage like you would find in, in shop bought things. Direct, straight away from your garden, straight to your plate, and that is really satisfying. If nothing else, it is worth growing. Just some of your favourite vegetables, if you can, in your own garden. And the taste, you can't compare the taste with shop bought produce either. The taste is going to be phenomenal. So that looks like a really good harvest for our lunch today. So some nice, beautiful radishes, some spinach and some Swiss chard. And I'll also be picking some of the other salad leaves as well as we go along. So I'm gonna harvest some more of the leaves for our lunch and I'll pass you now to Andrew, who's gonna be planting geranium macarizan in one of the beds. I'm really excited now about lunch because there's nothing better, as Paul said, than bringing that food out of the garden and bringing it into the house to your table. It's fantastic, nothing beats it. So it's gonna be a really lovely lunch. Now, as Paul said, I'm over here, I'm underneath this fritinia and I'm gonna be planting some beautiful geranium macarizum. Now, geranium macarizum is a favorite of ours and certainly of mine. I love the scent from the foliage. It's highly scented. It's a beautiful scent. And it's one of those when you're in the garden, you'd like it somewhere where you brush past just to get that scent. But on a lovely summer's day like this, nothing beats it. Now, it's got these gorgeous white flowers on, the lovely, beautiful red. The idea is here, is I'm gonna be growing them underneath the shrub. <clears throat> the reason for that is we've already got it growing on the other side and it's growing out of the bricks, in the soil itself. It tumbles over onto the lawn and it just creates the perfect edge into this stone. Now the stone is beautiful, but it's really nice to have it softened as well because there's nothing worse than too much stone and not enough plant. There's always space for plants. Now, Paul divided these last year and they were very, very tiny, tiny little things. The birds are enjoying themselves. Now, we've grown them on since then, obviously, and they look fantastic. Now, they've been in situ for quite a few weeks now. You might have seen them on other videos. These have just been placed on here waiting to go in. They can't wait to get the roots into the soil. It's fantastic. Deadheading, watering and planting are my three favourite things of all time. That's my official list. Now, this plant does well in shade. You know, you can grow it around the base of shrubs, around trees. It loves it. It loves shade. We've also grown it over many years uh, in one of our previous gardens. Um, and it grew in sun and it grew really, really well. It's also growing in sun here in this garden as well in one of the other borders. So it just shows it's a really versatile plant and a geranium, if you've not got this one, geranium macarizum, please do try it because it's well worth it. It will reward you for many years to come. It spreads really gently and it's easy to divide and that's the beautiful thing about geraniums and certainly about this geranium is that it's so easy to you know lift a clump and just divide it into pieces and you've got so much more for your money that way so many other parts of the garden where you can put this beautiful plant and also the great thing is you can give it away to other people to family or to friends as well and that's another exciting component to this but i'm going to get planting because I need to get these into the ground. Now, Paul has very kindly um, placed some compost just for nutrition, but also for the fact that there's a lot of, there's, there was basically many, many years ago, back in the day, there was a beautiful apple tree here and it was taken down, but 
the stump remained for many, many years. Now there are still pieces of the stump actually in this bed and there's still pieces of the wood itself from the tree. And this has cre created a fantastic haven for wood lice. There are so many wood lice in here and I noted that underneath the geraniums where we'd place them, the whole area and all underneath the soil and in the wood, you know, it's, it's the perfect habitat for them. So we're going to leave them where they are. I'm not going to disturb that ground at all. We've placed compost over the top and now I'm going to get these into that compost. So I'm not disturbing anything at all whatsoever. In fact, they'll thank us even more for this because now they'll be well hidden with the canopy of the geranium as well. So they'll be perfectly safe. So I'm going to get these in. So I'm going to start, I've got four plants. So as you can see, and you can sort of imagine what will happen eventually. You'll see something like this where they'll be growing through the cracks. It will tumble over and you'll have these beautiful white flowers um, in spring, late spring and early summer coming through. So it's going to look really, really nice. You can, you can imagine that, can't you? So it just creates a difference. As I say, softens the brick, creates again an even greater habitat for wildlife, but also it looks stunning with these flowers and the scent from that foliage. I like it. You know, someone else might say, mm, it's, not, it's not to my taste, but I, I really like it. I think it's a lovely scent. It's nice to have scent in the garden. You can't have enough of it. So what I'm going to do is now, these, as I say, it was last year when these were done. Let's have a look at the roots. Let's see what they're like. Oh, they're lovely. They're really, really nice. Very soft roots very gentle so I'll just tease those gently very fine roots so I'm going to pop these in and the idea is not to disturb too much of the wildlife in there because like I say we've put that compost on top for a reason and these are perfect just to go directly in like so and what I will do I'll use my hands is just to, to fill them in. I firm them in, but I fill around the plants with the compost like so. But the good thing is they're into the ground now and that's what matters. They're not gonna be happy if we keep them in these pots for much longer. And also I need to keep remembering because the soil level was only about up to here on the pot over time, it's, it's, you know, it's disappeared through the holes. Um, it, it's one of those things where you have to keep remembering that they're almost out of sight under here you have to remember yes they need watering come out water them and they're better in the ground plants don't thank you for being in containers like this for too long they really need to be in the ground where the roots can establish and they can do their own thing and that's the great thing about this but i love the way that these grow as well at speed you know they really do one minute they seem like little tiny things almost like they're See, there's a plant there as well. Plant there, plant there, potentially, plant there. That's the thing about geraniums, there's so many plants. I could get now one, two, three, four, five plants from this small clump out of a container that size. Incidentally, many, many years ago in Sheffield, well, Stannington, Sheffield, in our cottage garden, geraniums were certainly my favorite and they were something that we collected. And um, we did have a lot of geraniums in that garden. Obviously, when we left it, we couldn't bring them uh, because we were going to our courtyard garden. Well, we created a courtyard garden. So we couldn't really, um, we couldn't bring them with us, which is quite sad, really, because we had so many. We brought a few, but obviously we had a, a lot of plants in that garden and we were not able to bring them all. And, and that's quite sad, but it's okay. Someone else hopefully got some enjoyment from them, hopefully. Um, let's hope they were gardeners. So it's a nice thought, isn't it? Because I know not everybody's into gardening. I can't understand why, because it really is something that, pardon the pun, it grows on you. It really does. It's something that once you, you start to do it, it becomes addictive. And the thing is with, with gardening, it's, it's a case that you never know everything. We're always learning. 
I mean, I'm sure there are people that claim to know everything, but we never know everything. We're always learning and we learn from each other and we learn from videos like this. We learn from other people. We learn from our friends, from family, from neighbors. Um, through the years, it's an ongoing process like life itself. And life is it's a constant learning process and gardening is the same because it's part of that journey. And I just love getting down here like this. It's quite cramped conditions, as you can see, because this is uh, the Fritinius trying to, you know, it's, it's uh, poking into me, but that's fine. I don't mind that. It's nice to get up close and personal. What I'm trying to do this, it seems a bit cack handedly, but I'm trying to be as delicate as possible um, with the areas because I don't want to go too deep because I want to just go into where the compost has been put by Paul and not go any deeper because of the wood lice. Um, oh, this is lovely. And that's the perfect size to go in as well because that's about the depth of the, comp uh, the compost that's been put in. So that's perfect. So again, just placed in and then the compost can go back, ar back around it. And when these are planted, we will give them a really good watering as well daily. So after they've been planted, and um, every day, especially while this hot weather's on because we're having a really nice time of it at the minute. And us gardeners love this time of year when you can get out into the garden and just experience the sunshine. We've waited so long for it. You know, we've waited for many, many months for this. And it seems to be with us such a short space in, of time. So there's quite a, a nice, good sized stem there. So we have to be really careful planting this. Yeah, I can see some bark there, but no wood lice, because that's good. So we don't want to go too deep. And I think, you know, you never want to overwater your garden. You want to encourage those roots to go down into the ground as deep as possible. So when during, say, a heat wave and we have a really hot spell, like remember last year when temperatures got up to, you know, 39, 40, well, above 40 in some places. I think it was 39, 40 here uh, where we live. And what you want is to encourage those roots to go down into the ground. You don't want to be encouraging them to be the roots to stay on the surface. Now I can be guilty of this because I enjoy watering. And the, the problem with that is if you water continuously, constantly, I should say, the way that I do it sometimes, it, it, it's not great. You know, you need to encourage those roots to go down. So I'm gonna try and, and water much less because it's better for the plants and better for the environment and better for everything really. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna try and water much less. There are times when you do need it and certain plants, um, you know, do need that kind of uh, attention. But, oh, this is perfect. This is absolutely perfect. But you can water things too much. But remember, when you put new, new plants into the ground, they do need to be watered. You do need to keep an eye on that because otherwise if you just leave them to fend for themselves, you're gonna have some failures. Not always, but most of the time you're gonna have failures. You need to water stuff. I remember being with Paul at a garden center and a lady um, had brought back a hanging basket. Now, this is quite an interesting story. She brought this hanging basket back. She, she was so disappointed with it and, and rightly so, it looked terrible. But the reason why it looked terrible, it was all brown and all the plants were dead. She was asked by the lady on the, on the checkout, did you water it? And she said, no, why would I need to do that? Needless to say, she didn't get a refund on that, but it's a true story. Anyway, these are planted and they are looking good. And you can just imagine them soon tumbling over the side and softening these edges and it also creates more of a circle. Further round this area we do have a heather that's that's died off. Um, it, it, it's no longer living. That will be taken out at some stage but because the wood lice are happy in there at the minute and everything's happy the way that it, that it is, it's fine where it is. There's, there's no loss. We could also encourage this geranium to grow through it, but we'll see what happens with that. It might need to come out because it doesn't look very nice. But there you go. These are in. They're going to be watered now. They're looking good. 
Now, we've finished our geranium. Paul is now going to be planting some tomatoes out in a type of container. Well, it's something that we've never tried before. So, over to Paul. Thanks, Andrew. Those geraniums are going to be perfect, just planted underneath that fatinia, spilling over that lovely brickwork. So I'm going to be trying something different with tomatoes this year. I usually grow them in plastic containers, but I didn't really want to try that this year. I wanted to try something different. So what I did is I searched online and I've managed to find some of these fabric containers. So these come folded and they have little handles on. And these particular ones are rectangular. You can buy ones that are circular as well. And these can be used, apparently, this particular set, a lifetime span of around eight years. So we can continue to use these each year, clean them out after the end of the season and store them away for the following season to come. So we're gonna try these out. So in a container about this size, I'm gonna try and squeeze three cordon tomatoes in. So we'll see how it turns out. So I've already got two that I've filled with compost. So the first one are these moneymaker tomatoes. So these are cordon tomatoes and I've got three, like I said, that I'm gonna plant in here. So I'm just gonna upturn the pot and get those planted. So I'm gonna try and plant them up to probably that second set of leaves there. So I'm gonna just remove them ones because the more depth you have with these, the more stable they become. But not only that, the more roots they will form and that means they'll have more capacity to be fed and capacity for water as well. So that's the first one in. And this is the next one. So all these have been grown from seed and they've had a good few weeks now being hardened off. So they are now ready to be growing outdoors now that risk of frost has passed. So the final one there. They've grown into some lovely little plants. I mean, the root system on that is just lovely. So I'll pop that in there. I'm going as deep as I can in these containers. Now, because they are fabric, when you do fill them up with compost, they don't tend to keep that nice rectangular shape. Now, that's something that I'm gonna to have to live with. I do like to have straight lines, but I'll have to live with that, I think. So that's three in a container. Because these are gonna be cardon tomatoes, I'm also gonna put a cane in there as well. So that's gonna go in for each one. And I'm hoping the depth on here is going to be enough to make sure that they don't flop over. Because last year we had an issue because we grew them in quite small containers, smaller than what they would really need. We did find that when they dried out and we had a bit of wind, they would start to flop over. We also found that during the very high temperatures that we got last year, a lot of them did dry out too severely and they really suffered from that. Some of them did come back but we don't want to relive that again. So I'm just gonna tie these in, because with these being cord on tomatoes, we need to make sure that they have just the one stem. Any side shoots that appear, we need to be nipping those out. We need to be encouraging the growth and the flowers to be along the main stem. And that just makes sure all the energy goes towards making those tomatoes that will form from that stem, rather than being used for producing side shoots. So I'm just tying these in with some very nice loose twine. And there's nothing better when you're working with tomatoes of smelling that lovely foliage. It's an amazing scent. It's a scent of summer, I believe. So there we go. So that is the money makers done. So we're now going to plant the other cordon tomato, which is the beefsteak. 
in this next one. And these are Cardaboo. So we grew these last year. We had really good success with these last year. So we've decided to grow them again. And the, the fruits themselves were delicious. Nice and fleshy. Lovely and sweet. And just perfect with a salad. So I'm getting these in. Again, I'm doing three to a container. just need to get these canes in alongside. Now I'm just noticing that the depth of soil isn't great for these canes so we're gonna have to see how well they do stand up. So I have a feeling they're not going to be very secure. But we shall see. So I'm gonna tie them in. I mean, the other alternative we can do is also just maybe put something on the fence just to tie these canes up so they're not going to be leaning too far forward as the plant grows. So now that risk of frost has passed, it's like a bit of a mad rush to get all of those tender plants into the garden and out of the house because they've been cluttering up the, the kitchen windowsill for quite a few months now. So we're going to be able to a bit more room to move. We've also been using our summer house as well to have, have plants during the evening where it's cooler and bring them into the sunshine during the day. So we're going to have more space in there to move around as well. So that's great. So that's it. So we're going to do something with the other very small tomatoes that we're growing. So those are mini bell. So we're going to probably get maybe maybe probably six to one of these containers because they're going to grow as a very small miniature tomato they're not going to need as much room to move and obviously they're not going to be cordons either so they're just going to grow naturally any side shoots they have we're just going to leave them on so i'm going to get on with doing that while andrew now is going to plant our dahlia into a container thank you paul for uh, all your hard work there with the tomatoes um, I'm sure we're going to get some amazing results and those bags seem really really interesting as Paul said we've never used those before so they it's going to be interesting to see what happens especially with the canes not going all the way down as well to secure the plant so we'll see what happens with that one anyway I'm here now planting this beautiful dahlia into this gorgeous pot look at that for a pot doesn't get much better does it I really like the uh, terracotta one that I've used to plant the rose in that you've already seen and this one these are my two favorite pots in the garden now this dahlia is the tuber was planted in April by Paul and it's called purple gem what a lovely name I can't wait for this one to flower I do like dahlias I know that many people see them as being something that's old-fashioned. I think they've come into fashion again. I really do, because you do see them around a lot now. And you hear so many people talking about them, and I'm not surprised. They are wonderful. Dahlias are fantastic plants. You know, do give them a try. So we're going to plant this one up. Now, there's already, we've already put some compost in here, into this pot. And it's quite a gritty compost because that's what the dahlia will need to survive. You know, it's not something that's gonna like sitting in water, okay? So whilst it might not like to dry out, it's not gonna be something that's gonna be, you know, if there's no drainage hole in something or, you know, in a pot or limited drainage, it's not gonna like it. So it's got a nice gritty compost in there to start with. So what I'm gonna do is get him out of the pot nice little label there ready so i'm going to take him and out of his pot not damaging him oh he's well and truly happy in this pot he seems to want to stay in so i'm going to release it just by squeezing around the pot gently 
try not to break the pot because we do use these again for obvious reasons we just keep using them and using them and using them uh, until they fall to pieces and that's the way forward that's what we should all be uh, doing oh perfect absolutely perfect look at that some wonderful fine roots on there it's like a work of art look at that it really is I could just imagine that on a painting and have that on the wall. It's beautiful. So just release some of the, at the bottom. I'm obsessed with releasing roots, but that's okay. That's good. So now he's been placed into the container. So I'm going to place him where he's going to look its best. So towards you, um, that's how he's going to look good. Now, what I'm going to do is put some more of this wonderful compost around him. And he's going to be really, really happy in here. It's because I'm trying to do this and I'm right-handed, not left-handed. So I'll come around this side. But yeah, dahlias are, are stunning plants. They really do do the job. I love the vibrancy because as you, as you all know, I really like vibrant colors and I just love the vibrancy of the flowers. And do you know something? They are worth growing. I know that we grew one last year. And with amazing results. And this year, it's going to be even better. There's so many people that grow dahlias, um, well, for a living. Um, but there's so many people now that grow them and I just, I just think that they are so beautiful. They're such a beautiful, um, cheery, um, graceful flowers. And there are all kinds of dahlias to get. There really is one for every occasion. So I've almost done this now. making sure that I don't put too much compost in, but that there's enough. Oh, that looks wonderful. That looks so nice. And it's even better with this great pot we have here as well. Perfect, look at that. That's gonna be amazing. And that sits nicely on the deck in here, next to the summer house. So when we're in there, we can see it. Also, when we're out and about in the garden, because we spend a lot of time up here, we're gonna see it. And that's what we want. We want it to be in a place where we see it, where it gets the best results. Now, Paul is going to be sowing some lettuce and some kale next. So, over to Paul. So now is the perfect time to be sowing kale. And my trusty little seed box. We've got two seeds that I'm going to be sowing this month. And one of them is this kale called Nero di Toscana. I probably pronounced that wrong, but I've no idea how to pronounce it. So that's as good as you're going to get it. Nero di Toscana. It sounds Italian to me. Um, and this is a free packet of seeds that came with, I think it was the May issue of Gardener's World. So the one the way you get the free two for one voucher card that allows you to get into different gardens with a two for one entry which is real brilliant so i'm going to try this kale and the idea is i'm going to sow it in these module trays first of all and then as this space allowed in the veg plot i will then be planting a few out but because kale is quite a largest plant i probably won't get that many of these in there so I can always grow some in containers as well. Any that are not able to fit in the, the raised bed. And then we'll get them. Now kale seeds are quite big. So you can actually station sow them. They're lovely and round. And it's just a case of maybe getting, I'm gonna put two to each module. I'm just going to space them out like that. So there's double the chance of germination in each cell. I 
and this is a lovely kale this variety is one of those ones that has these lovely green ribbed um, leaves to it you can see on the packet lovely ribbed lovely texture and with kale you can always take off the juvenile leaves and use them in salads or you can wait till they mature and have them as a as more of a vegetable that you might want to steam so i've got two seeds in every in every station so i'm just going to get some of this lovely vermiculite and just cover those up And the thing we need to remember about the month of June is that during the spring months we're busily sowing lots and lots of vegetables, lots and lots of seeds and then you could be filled into the feeling of I've sown all the vegetables now, that should be enough. And if you do want succession with your vegetables and your salads, you do need to keep, keep sowing those seeds. So every two to three weeks keep sowing batches of seeds so that you can always have that continual cycle of, of vegetables that you can be harvesting. So that is the kale done. So I'll give these a water in a little while. And next on to some salad leaves. So this salad leaf is one I've not grown before. Again, it came with Gardener's World magazine. And this one is called Romaine Ballon. Or, yeah, Ballon. So it's a nice long leaved one. So it should be a nice one. And again, I'm only going to sow a few seeds per module. So it's just a very small handful. Probably no more than maybe five in each compartment. And it's great when we get free seeds with magazines. Sometimes you get seeds that you wouldn't normally try. But because you have a magazine and they're giving them away free, rather than waste them, it's a good idea to, uh, to try them out. And who knows, it could become something you, you grow year in, year out. It becomes that much of a favourite for you. And then again, some more vermiculite just over the top, just until you can't see those seeds on the surface anymore. And then give them a firm down. Okay, so I'm going to give them a lovely water. You can also sow during June other members of the brassica family. So things like your sprouts, your broccoli, purple sprouting broccoli and cabbages. June's a really good month to get them going as well. So they can be planted direct now at this time of year. Or if you prefer to, you can plant them into module trays just like I'm doing now. And then when they're large enough and when the space that allows in your vegetable plot, you can then get them out. Because we've just harvested some of the radishes from our veg plot, um, by the time next month comes along, they'll probably be all gone by then. And we'll have a space that we can then pop in some other plants that we've got growing and they can be then 
utilising that space at the time. And that's what it's all about, making sure there's no space that's being unused because unused space just runs to weeds and that's the last thing we want. Be productive and also be proactive. Get something sown so that you've always got that succession. That is my tip for this month. So with that being said, I will pass you back to Andrew who is going to be giving you a little tour of the garden and the flower borders and showing you some of the things that's in flower this month. Now this is my favourite part of the programme because I get to take you around our garden looking at some of the plants that are really special to us at this moment in time in June. Now the first thing I want to talk about is two geraniums. Now we've got geranium patricia here. Now geranium patricia produces these gorgeous magenta flowers and it is so reliable it keeps on flowering you keep deadheading it it keeps flowering then over to this side we have brookside now this geranium is also a good doer and is something that we grew many many years ago in our cottage garden both geraniums and we had a few plants of each geranium and the tip here is to plant these two I know that in this border they're separated but if you were to buy them a really good tip is to get say three plants of Patricia three plants of Brookside if you've got the space plant them on mass and together they really are an award-winning combination they look great together the magenta with the blue they, they seem to set each other off it just looks amazing so that's a really good tip for you there you know get three plants of each plant them on mass if you've got the space if not just get one of each and put them close together uh, but they're really great geraniums now over to the digitalis two of my other favorites at the moment are the digitalis purpurea that we have behind me here now there's a few plants there and I just love the bees going into those little booths. The bees absolutely adore it and that sound that they make as they're inside, that little kind of buzzing sound, it's amazing. I just love it. Now, Digitalis um, seeds themselves are highly toxic, but they are used in medicine, as we know already. So. Yeah, they're a fantastic plant, a great doer in the garden, and just fantastic to see. They remind you of a cottage garden and the, and hedgerows, and they just take you to, a, I think, a special, magical place. Now, I like tall plants in general, and these are no exception. You know, I know that they're biennial. I know that they basically grow the first year, and the second year, they form a flower spike then they die but the seed that they set they self seed everywhere so they could cover literally if we left these seed heads on they would cover this whole area with new plants and probably into the lawn and into the next border probably as well so you know they are a great plant to have they're fantastic to look at and they just promote so much interest and like I say just seeing the bees go inside and hearing them buzzing around in these little cubicles so to speak um, it's fantastic my second favorite in this area is the centranthus ruba now centranthus really like this kind of position here it gets full sun so it gets sun all day um, and it likes to grow in these kind of places. At the moment it's in a rockery, but it likes rocks. There's a special place that we go to where I've been going to since I was a child um, near Towin in North Wales. And along the railway line there, along the seawall, you'll see lots of Centranthus growing in the rocks, going down to the railway itself in North Wales. You see this so much. It was one or two plants that have somehow self-seeded and it's spread all the way along. And we love going to North Wales. And when we do, we go for that walk along the path just to see the Centranthus. Well, not just to see the Centranthus, but to see all other kinds of plants growing. But certainly the Centranthus is one of those as well. It's something that I always appreciate seeing. It's so cheery. I love the colour. 
and it just makes that statement with these tall spires and these flowers that extend all the way along. There'll be more flowers coming from these lower stems as well. So it will just be encased in flowers and as these die off, there'll be more flowers coming. The trick is with Centranthus, if you grow this in the garden, you know, it likes rocks, so it will seed in any kind of crevices. Anywhere it can find, it will self-seed. But if you want to stop this from taking hold, self-seeding everywhere. Trick is, as soon as the leaves, sorry, as soon as the flowers start to go brown, just take the head off completely. Take the head off, deadhead regularly, and it will be fine. You'll not have it self-seeding everywhere. So you can keep it in check that way. And that's what we do here. Now, onto the next plant, which is my poppies. Now, the great thing about these, they sort of sum up my personality. They're vibrant, they're cheery, and it is just so wonderful to see them out now like this. That's actually my favorite color. So that's my favorite red. Um, this one's a little paler red. They are perfect if you want to add that pop of colour into your borders. These are the plants, plants to go with and they just look awesome. They really do. They're very happy here. They do take a little time to establish. If you buy them as small plants, you know, in a normal small container, pop them in. You'll find the first year they do flower, but they're pretty insignificant the following year and year after. They will give you flowers like this and you'll get lots flowers on them as you can see it's doing really well on this side of the garden and it's just lovely to see the bees going inside them and sort of twirling around on the pollen it's absolutely fantastic another one is this beautiful geum which is totally tangerine now we've discussed this before on one of my little tours i think it was on the last video i'm not sure but we talked about this, but look at how it's still flowering. It will keep flowering throughout the summer. We'll keep deadheading it. And it just looks amazing. It just adds a perfect array of color and a combination between the blue of the geranium Ibericum, which is a really beautiful blue and a soft shaped flower. And these smaller flowers of the totally tangerine GM and they just go really really well together and it's just so lovely to see them you know sometimes you'll put plants together and you think oh yeah that looks nice oh that's lovely but there's sometimes when plants go together you think wow they give you the wow factor and that's what we're always looking for we're always searching for that winning combination as gardeners and certainly this is a winning combination two very very different colors but they do go well together they look amazing. Now, onto the next one. And that is Mrs. Kendall Clark. The most stunning geranium you can find, honestly. I love this one. We've had it for many, many years. So many years. And I just think it's beautiful. Now, Mrs. Kendall Clark, she grows quite tall. And she flowers. And you know, if the foliage starts to get tidy with, untidy, sorry, with geraniums, you can, well, we've always done this as well. We chop them back using shears, just cut them back to the ground and they grow new growth. It grows new growth and it looks great. You have fantastic foliage, but very often geraniums will flower again. In Mrs. Kendall Clark's case, this is not what happens if you cut it back you will get lots of lovely new foliage and it'll just look tidier in the garden you know for late summer but you will not get these stunning flowers again once it's flowered sorry once she's flowered that's it it's you know she's finished so really it's one of those cases of with this geranium mrs kendall clark enjoy the flowers appreciate them and look forward to them again next year Another plant that is a firm favorite is Campanula. Now we love Campanula and we have a nice clump growing in a pot there, a lovely white. It's a really nice plant. And it reminds me of my nan who's currently in hospital. She's very, very poorly. She's had a fall and she, she's not in, in a very good way. Um, 
but it reminds me of her because she always had Canterbury bells, as she used to call them, in her garden, uh, which is just around the corner from where we live now. And when I was little, she always had these in the garden. She had the blues and the whites. So it's so lovely to, to continue that memory forward in our own space right now in this present time and to see them flowering like that. White is so gentle. It's, it reminds us of tranquility, of peace. And we, we, you feel that when you start to include white in the garden, it does soften things a lot, especially if you've got a lot of really vibrant colors in there. White's a really nice way of softening things and just making things seem more peaceful and tranquil. Now, for the next plant. This is Primula bulliana. Now, it's the most beautiful orange. I absolutely love this one. It's such a gorgeous plant. Once it's established, you get so many of these flower spikes. It loves damp soil. Now, something I have just noticed as well, before we continue with the Primula, I just want to talk about the um, Ligularia next to it. Now, if you notice, it's starting to sulk a little bit, and that's just happened within the past hour. We've been outside in the garden for all morning, but that's just happened. And what that is, is a temperature very high today. It's even higher than yesterday, I think. And what's happening is, it's not liking it. The ground is, it's pretty shady. Once it gets, once we get into the afternoon, this area becomes shady. So these plants do like it here. But that one, you always need to keep on top of the water levels. It really does like to be in moist soil. And that's why it prefers to be at the edge of a brook or pond or something where it's, can almost, its roots can access the water. It really does thrive in those kind of conditions. Otherwise, it sulks like this. But this liquid area will have the most gorgeous yellow flowers on soon. Within the next month or so, they will be flowering and that will look awesome. Now, back to the Primula. So Primula bulliana, another recommendation of ours. We love this one. It is gorgeous. You can't beat it. I mean, what's not to like about it? You want something vibrant in the garden. You know, I like vibrancy. And this is one of those vibrant plants that you just think, wow. You know, people look at it, they think, oh, what's that? What's that? They're not familiar with plants. Um, and they, they really do seem to gravitate towards this. And what I also want to mention is there is another primula that we really recommend. We've not got that in the garden to show us anymore. We've not got this plant in the garden. It's Primula florende. So Primula florende. And Primula florende is something that we grew many, many years ago in our cottage garden. We had many plants and it has the most gorgeous tall spires with yellow flowers, most gorgeous yellow flowers and it's scented. The scent from Primula florende is out of this world. It's so lovely and it is certainly my favorite and I think probably one of Paul's favorites as well, but we've not got it in this garden. Um, so that, that'll be something for the future to get hold of again, because it will be nice to grow it again. And, you know, I think, I think that's a really good recommendation there. So if you can get Primula florende as well, as well as Bulliana, please do try it. Also, we've mentioned before in the last episode, I was planting Miller's Crimson that's in the corner there. And it's its first year, it's finished flowering now. But Miller's Crimson is another Primula that, that you will love. So if you can get the three together, so if you can get Primula Bulliana, if you can get Primula Miller's Crimson, and also the Primula Florende, um, please do. Remember they like damp soils, they don't like it dry. So do not put them in dry conditions because they're not gonna like it and they're not gonna last as well. So yeah, that is just out of this world and i can't get enough of it it just whenever i see that color i always want to run inside and get a cool drink it's just so vibrant it's so bright it's so cheery and that's it mouth watering that's what i was looking for just to look at them just before they open as well the buds there they're gorgeous they really are now alcamilla mollis just here so if I move forward a little bit and sit down here, it's just getting its 
acid green flowers. Now I love our Camilla Mollis. You can't beat it when it's been raining and you've got those droplets of rainwater on the leaves, like little jewels. It's also known as ladies mantle as well. And this was something that we had so much of in our cottage garden many years ago. It was everywhere. It was a lovely plant to have and is now right now in this garden. Just look at it. It's just fascinating. I love the way it grows. I love the way it self seeds everywhere as well, because if we left, if we didn't cut the flower spikes once they'd finished flowering, you would literally have Alcamilla mollis running all the way along these pebbles here and into the grass if you let the grass to grow long. It really does self seed everywhere, but it's beautiful and well worth it. Now let's take a look at our gladioli that I planted on the last episode. Look at how far they've come. Isn't that amazing? It's stunning to see them. They're so nice, they're, they're doing so well. And I know that my nan will be very proud of me because as I mentioned in the last episode, in the 1980s, she used to grow gladioli quite a bit and 70s as well, but certainly in the 80s and early 80s, mid 80s, she used to have a lot in the garden. And I'm excited to be carrying on that wonderful tradition in her name. And I just know that these are going to be, oh, they're going to be so lovely when they're flowering and I can just enjoy the flowers. I can cut them, I can bring them inside. I can do anything that I want to with them. And Paul's idea of, of putting little pieces of holly on top of the pots. And it's really worked because we, our resident squirrel, or two resident squirrels, I think there might be three actually, our, our resident squirrels, they seem to enjoy, as they do, digging up pots, burying nuts and seeds and things. So what Paul come up with the idea of is using holly, placing it on top of the pots like this, on top of the soil, the compost, and then it acts as a deterrent. It stops the squirrels in the tracks. They think, mm, not liking this, not liking this sharp prickly holly. I'll leave well alone. And it has worked. Genuinely, it really does work. So if you cover your plants with holly like that, it's gonna put them off digging up the pots and things. And that's what we want, you know, cause we want to enjoy the garden with wildlife, but we don't want them digging out everything. Every, you know, every day, literally, we were coming out and there was things dug out of pots and things. So, so yeah, so this has worked. Paul's little trick there. Put the holly over the top like that and it really does prevent the squirrel from uh, doing any more damage. But just look at the progress that they've made. I'm so happy with the gladioli and I can't wait to appreciate them. In order to keep the plants flowering and in tip-top condition, looking good, we need to keep deadheading. Now this Almeria here, or Thrift as it's known, is doing brilliantly. It's got lots of lovely fresh flowers on, lots more flowers coming from the base of both plants, but we need to keep on top of the deadheading just to keep the display up. And that's the same for the two geraniums at either side here. So we've got geranium sanguinium alba there, and this just has a few flowers that need deadheading, a few spent flowers, and the same with geranium nimbus here as well. It's just to keep them looking good because we want to keep that display going but keep them looking good as well for as long as possible throughout the summer. So on this plant what we would do is just cut these spent flowers right back like that and this is my trusty bucket behind me to put all the spent flowers in and it just rejuvenates the plant and it's one of my favorite activities i do like deadheading i really do like it sometimes i can be a bit overzealous i'm almost out waiting for, for a flower to go over so i can cut it back um, but it just does keep things in check and keeps everything looking good and that's what we want we want the garden to look great we've waited long enough for these flowers we want to enjoy them for as long as possible and we want to keep the plant the plant flowering that's the key because otherwise it's going to think all its work's done and it's going to stop flowering and we do not want that now some of these just look at quite tired they're going over so whilst there's still a few petals on their flower petals it is once those six flowers are finished 
is spent and going to seed. So I am going to take those off because I just want it to look a bit nicer. And what a perfect day for deadheading as well. It doesn't get better, does it? The weather truly is stunning. We are very, very lucky to be having this nice spate of good weather. Wow, that looks better already. And I'm gonna leave those ones on because that does look better. Now, on the geranium, sanguinium, Albert, we've got just a few. That's about to finish and go over. So yeah, we've got a few on there and it just keeps the display up. Ah, there's a few there. And on Nimbus, there's quite a few, look. So I'll just take those back to say there, because we know that from here, we've got lots more flowers to come and we're gonna be enjoying those. And it also just keeps everything looking just as it should do because we want people to come into the garden and say, wow, look at that plant, we don't want it. I mean, there's certain times when we do want a plant to go to seed and, you know, when a plant, eventually, when it gets towards the end of the year, what we do is we leave all the seed heads on everything. So the last flush of flowers on most things, we'll just leave the seed heads on because it's, you know, food for the birds, it's places to hide for other insects. It's great to leave seed heads on, but at this moment in time, we want to keep going. We don't want the plants to think they've done the job and finish flowering. That's the last thing that we want to happen. And it is easy for a plant to, plant to think that when it's, uh, you know, when we just leave it and forget the deadheading. That's the thing with perennials. You're always deadheading, but they reward you with these magical flowers. So it's well worth it. So the seed potatoes that we planted last month are doing great. Just look at how high they are now in the bags. They're coming right to the surface, right through, and we need to keep them covered. So what I'm gonna do is roll the bags up a little further, and then make sure that all this foliage that we can see is covered with the compost. And it's not an exact science. It doesn't have to be perfect, but we do need to cover them and keep them covered. So this is so exciting because we just know that eventually we're going to be eating so many fantastic potatoes that have grown in these bags. So rather than throw the bags away, we've reused them. And that's the beauty of gardening. We can really reuse so many things and make our gardening journey a more interesting place in doing so. I mean, when I was little, I'd have never thought, I mean, Nan used to grow potatoes and I know that, that Paul, when he was younger, a boy, he used to grow potatoes as well in his garden. My dad actually grew them as well. But I know that I couldn't imagine my Nan, you know, using an old compost bag. So it's quite, it's, it's such an amazing thing that we can recycle it, we can use it again. And uh, it's amazing. So just making sure it's all nice and covered and obviously in temperatures like what we're experiencing at the moment because it's been such a nice day we need to make sure that we're on top of the watering as well because we don't want these bags to to uh to uh, dry out too much and then end up with uh ruining our crop so that's perfect and then this last one is really really important to get this done and keep on top of it but the rewards will be magnificent when we're eating our own produce all grown at home not bought from the shop and uh, that will be the ultimate reward and the taste. Nothing beats your own produce. It really doesn't. No matter what it is that you're growing, nothing beats it. So that's covered. They're all looking good now. So all that I need to do now is give them a really good water, but I'm really pleased with the progress. Now over to something really, really interesting. Paul is planting his cucumber plant. So he's got this little plant going and there's lots of baby cucumbers coming from it. So he's gonna plant that now. 
So we've never grown cucumbers before, but we saw some plants in the garden center um, probably last month. And I came back home with this one called Hannah F1. And I just couldn't resist. So in the meantime, I've been keeping it indoors. We've been hardening it off and it has grown already some little baby cucumbers that I just develop in there. So now it's fully hardened off and risk of frost is gone. What we're gonna do is plant it in a container and we're gonna try and grow it vertically up an obelisk. So this is the container that I've got. And I'm just going to fill this container with some good compost. And the thing about cucumbers is, along the stem, it will form roots if you do place that stem underneath the ground. So I'm gonna place it just to, slightly just below where that first leaf is coming from, because I want to make it as stable as possible within this container. So a bit more compost along the top. And you might notice that the leaves have a bit of a white tinge to them. And what that's happened is, as we've been hardening this off, it's been left out and unfortunately it's been in the blazing sun. And this white edging to the leaves is typical of when the plant has been shocked by too much sunlight. So I'm hoping it's gonna be still fine. I'm gonna place it somewhere a little bit shadier first, just to make sure that it gets off, off to a good start. I don't wanna give it any more shock. So it's a bit upside down. Lovely nice root ball there. And I'm gonna place that in. And then with some more compost that can go all around. I'm just firming in around the roots. This is such an exciting moment because I've been watching this cucumber growing and seeing those little baby cucumbers and willing time to pass, thinking, please get a little bit warmer, please get get to June and get it out into the garden so it can grow. And that time has finally come and it's gonna thank us for it. And we've tasted homegrown cucumbers before, and believe me, there's nothing better. They beat the shop bought ones by a mile. So it's definitely worth trying. So with that planted, I'm gonna keep the label so I know what it is. And then the idea is I'm gonna pop the obelisk and the obelisk will fit perfectly around this pot. So I'm just gonna place that on the ground, just so you get the idea. And then this obelisk will fit just perfectly around it. So I need to make sure that that's within the frame and that just fits just perfectly around there. And then what I'll do is I will move this so that it scrambles up like that. And as it grows, I'll keep twining it round so it goes in a spiral all around the top so it gets to the very top and with a bit of luck we'll have all those juicy cucumbers along the edges or inside that we can pick just when ready so i'm really excited to see how this is going to develop so that's it for this episode we really do hope that you've enjoyed watching us today and following us through the garden in the month of june we've come into the summer house just to film the very end because it's sweltering outside. So if you are spending a lot of time in the garden, just be careful with that hot sun because it can be very damaging. Make sure you put on your sunblock and make sure you have protection because you can get very poorly from being out in hot sun for too long. So we've also, just- 
there's something else I do want to say. As gardeners, we seem to spend so much time running around, finding jobs to do at this time of year because there genuinely is so much to do. Also, just make the time to relax. Yeah. Take time out because we do it, don't we? We yeah. do the same thing, don't we? Yeah. We, we go whether, out to the garden. Whether it's in the morning before work, come out with a cup of tea and relax, or whether it's the last thing at the evening when all your jobs are done, you've had your dinner, and you just need that little time just to just to come down from the day's work and just relax in the nice serenity of your own gardens. Enjoy the beauty that you've created. Yeah. And that's what it's about. It's not just about creating beauty, it's about yeah. being able to take a step back yeah. and enjoy that beauty as well. Yeah. So until the next time, please take care. If you do have any comments, please pop them in the comments box below. And as always, please hit that like button. It really does help push our videos forward on YouTube. We'd appreciate it. And that is amazing if you could do that for us. So in the meantime, please take care and we will see you very soon on the next one. See you on the next one.